Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. It's very exciting to see many, many of you on the line this afternoon. We're excited to have you with us here today to join in learning from the collective knowledge of the NYU community. My name is James Hurley, and I'll be your host for the program this afternoon. Before we begin, I wanted to note that all of us here at NYU and in particular at the Alumni Association hope that you and your families are safe and well. We host over 700 events per year and we look forward to the time when we can gather again in person safely. Until that, we're digital. My role as Senior Director of Alumni Relations for New York University gives me the pleasure to get to host many of these events around the world each year. Before I introduce our two special guest speakers, I wanted to give a very special welcome to some of our 265 registrants with us this afternoon. I always like to see who's with us before these events and give a special welcome to the oldest alum and the youngest alum. And this afternoon, I'd like to extend a very, very warm welcome to a graduate of the medical school, class of 1957 back when we still charged tuition for our medical school. He's celebrating 63 years as an alumnus of New York University. And a very big welcome to the 17 alumni who are graduating, who are joining us this afternoon, who graduated in the class of 2020, only a few short weeks ago. Welcome, we're excited to have you. We're also joined by over 40 graduates of the Stern School of Business, 29 from the College of Arts and Science, and we have 26 alums from the College School of Global Public Health, and an additional eight from CUSP. We're also joined by six double violets, that is alumni who have received not one, but two degrees from the university. Welcome all. Now I'd like to take a brief moment to introduce our two special guests for this afternoon. And pass the program eventually over to them. I'm thrilled to introduce my colleagues, Deborah Lafer and Thomas Kirchner. Deborah joins us from the Department of Civil and Urban Engineering in the Tandon School of Engineering, and as a professor of urban informatics and director of the Citizen Science Program in the Center for Urban Science and Progress at New York University. She's a renowned academic who has won many awards and accolades for her research. One of the most notable is perhaps the 2016 commissioning and hanging of her portrait by the Royal Irish Academy as one of eight researchers selected to celebrate Irish women in science and engineering. Thomas joins us from the School of Global Public Health at New York University and also works as the director of the M health lab or mobile health lab there. He uses GIS to understand health related behavior and decision making in real time. And this includes how people make decisions about where they eat and where they drink, the places they go to exercise in their neighborhoods, as well as the amount of time that they spend outdoors. And if memory serves correct, they had not previously worked together prior to this engagement. And with that, I'd like to pass it off to Tom to run us through some of the initial elements of the research. As the program progresses, please feel free to posit questions in the Q&A function. We'll be monitoring them and addressing them towards the conclusion of today's session. Over to you, Tom. Thanks a lot, James. Pleasure to be with all of you and um, looking forward to the discussion today. So I wanna start at 30,000 feet or 10,000 feet or whatever this is and try to think big picture to start and go with the question that pretty much everyone has right now. You know, when, if ever, are we going to be able to reopen safely? How are we going to be able to do that? And of course, there are many, many aspects of that that are outside of our control. But from a public health practice point of view, from a scientific point of view, what we typically want to do is operationalize this kind of question. And we want to do so in policy terms and research terms and pragmatically in New York City and elsewhere. Uh, a, a lot of that comes down to evaluation and science around these mitigation efforts like the pause law and uh, laws that are meant to uh, reduce the spread within urban areas. Now, 
I've got in the slide here on the left hand slide side a classic example of a socio ecologic model that we might use in public health. There's many versions of this. Uh, I don't know if I can control the slide, but essentially um, there, there's a uh, circle in the middle that says human action and behavior. You see that? That's sort of the central node. And you can see how uh, extending upwards, you have things that you could consider above the skin factors. You see micro, meso, macro, global level factors on human behavior. And then below you have what you could call roughly below the skin factors. And you have all of these moving uh, across time. Now, these can be very useful sorts of frameworks for understanding the full scope of a problem. But you know, just pushing variables into boxes like this often doesn't uh, mean you know, a complete scientific project. It can be an organizational framework, but not necessarily one with hypotheses and so forth. When we try to layer in a policy like the pause uh, ordinance in New York City, you can imagine that affecting, if you look in this, in this figure at the meso level, you have work sites, schools, communities, healthcare listed there. Yeah, so you could imagine uh, placing into that box the idea of, a, of something like the, the pause ordinance. There's this subtle irony, though, which is that while these policies can be understood and contextualized themselves within a framework like this, they themselves inherently are blind to their ecological context, right? When we lay these policies down, it's typically in pretty blanket fashion. And inevitably, the policies are implemented differentially as a, it's not a controversial thing to say because they're implemented as a function of the geographic distribution of the things that they're meant to, that they're meant to regulate. So for instance, the distribution of restaurants across New York City is going to be inherently directly related to the way the pause ordinance is on the ground implemented across the city, right? So when we want to actually build a science base to, to, to study these things, uh, we need typically more information. And so what we will often use, there's different approaches to this as well, but the one that we're basing our work on is what generally can be referred to as the HAVE model. This is uh, H-A-V-E. And if you look now, bringing this up on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, the idea, just to be really concrete, with uh, the current situation, hosts would be people, human beings who have not yet contracted or have uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, agent, which we've got on the top of this little figure. What's a vector? Well, it would be anything really bringing those two together, right? So if this was malaria, the vector could be a mosquito. If this was cigarette smoking, the vector could be industry distribution of, of cigarettes. Here, the vector is multifaceted. The vector extends from the environment in some ways. What's the environment? Well, it's the physical environment. I mentioned restaurants, the world we walk through. The environment also includes policy. Where things get really tricky, though, is when hosts become vectors, right? Because, of course, when infected individuals become vectors for the disease uh, for other individuals, that's where you get into a situation where viral spread can happen. And this is the way we can use this model to conceptualize the way these factors not just overlay on one another, like we might do on the left-hand side, but this is a more of an interactive framework that uh, we can use. So. Our project, Deborah's going to talk, uh, Dr. Lafer's going to talk more specifics about this project that's been funded by the National Science Foundation uh, to, to burrow down on this. It's really about collecting hyper local, perishable, call it quote unquote, perishable data that we have to collect now, we can't collect later. And it's really going to allow us to actually evaluate the operational mechanisms of things like pause policies and other uh, procedural recommendations that cities might uh, want to develop. And importantly, uh, optimize. We've got a lot to learn and we're not out of the woods yet, right? So uh, this is a special project in the sense that it is a collaboration. Uh, Dr. Lafer and I have not worked directly before, but we're rapidly building that collaboration as she's going to, to go through. It's been 
rather remarkable. So, um, you know, myself bringing in, I guess, representing the public health side in a, in a, in a way that's going to have to do, and I'm going to circle back to this after uh, Dr. Lafer goes through the meat of the project so far, has to do with how we understand the way things are changing on the ground. You might think about the vector environment uh, as it could be objectively surveyed. Uh, and then though, where things really get interesting, and this is where I'm gonna hand it off, has to do with that human vector element, right? Because it's not just what we can observe in a GIS, it's how do humans interact with these three-dimensional vector environments? And when we talk about humans, we're not just talking about mobility traces, we're talking about fear, we're talking about decision-making, groupthink, stigma, all sorts of challenging issues and really requires a, a deep dive, uh, we believe, to try and capture. So really it's about where does the rubber hit the road? Where the rubber hits the road is with vectors. As we think of them, we can think of vector control strategies. And in this project, we're thinking about the sort of three-dimensional vector environment that really is representative of what's happening on the streets of New York and elsewhere. So um, with that, let me hand it over to Dr. Lafer. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here today, both as fac a faculty member, but also as an alumna. Um, and over the past four months, we have heard Governor Cuomo talk a lot about New York tough. And today I'm gonna show you that firsthand. Uh, you often hear about the great work that faculty do, but we're just the face of this amazing uh, dedication, hard work, and bravery that's really happening at your alma mater uh, every day during this pandemic. So today I'm going to tell you an incredible story. It's like the craziest project I've ever done in 35 years of research and the amazing people that have helped me and Dr. Kirshner achieve this. Uh, so the project we're going to be showing you the actual results for was an NSF funded project called DETER, Developing Epidemiology Mechanisms in Three Dimensions to Enhance Response. And, and again, the idea was to collect touch behavior data from high risk areas outside of medical facilities and in the subway and to take a really hyper local approach, the exact times it happened, the exact places it happened and extremely detailed behavioral records to really help inform and understand what's happening in an unprecedented time. Oops, let's see if we can progress here. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a quick overview and put this project a little bit in its academic and historic context to explain some of the challenges that we faced, introduce you to the methodology and implementation, give you an update as of today, uh, where we are with this project, share with you some initial findings, and then provide a little bit of context and next steps. And at that point, I'm gonna turn the uh, presentation back to Dr. Kirshner to give you some more information about how you might wanna be involved with something like this and some other work that we're doing. Uh, from an academic context, this proposal was funded under something called the National Science Foundation Rapid Program. And it's unlike any other program at NSF. It, as uh, Tom mentioned, it's really to collect perishable data. And it was intended in a post-disaster scenario. So it was used after Hurricane Katrina, after Fukushima, after the Boston Marathon bombing. Uh, and the idea is that you go out and you collect this data very quickly and then you release it to the community without a lot of analysis, without a lot of intervention. Uh, the RAPID program itself is quick, but it has modest funding. Uh, it spans all areas of National Science Foundation, including the social sciences, and it works unlike any other grant that you actually do a pitch to a program director. It's usually one or two pages. They then invite you or not uh, to submit a short white paper, which is typically six pages plus your budget. And then if necessary, put in your institutional review board permission. So this is any, what we need to get anytime we work with human beings or with animals. And then the contract award happens anywhere from days to a few weeks from the time this process starts to the time we actually have the money and are on the ground. So that's really different. Many uh, granting agencies take at least six months, if not a year, to get you funding. Um, so let's look at 
that this in kind of the historic context of COVID-19. So we had the first con confirmed case in the US on January 22nd. Uh, shortly thereafter, the first community transfer case in the US was identified. And at the same time, the WHO declares a global health emergency. The next day, the US declares a public health emergency. And we then kind of skip forward and, and it's kind of quiet and, and people see these things happening overseas, but they're, they're not quite sure what's with the vulnerability, uh, what's happening, you know, maybe in Washington. And then all of a sudden, um, at the very beginning of March, we got our first case announced in New York City. Uh, about three days later, on March the 4th, the MTA announces that they're going to start disinfecting the trains. Uh, I think if nothing else good comes out of COVID, we'll have cleaner trains, so we can all be happy about that. Uh, and very shortly thereafter, NYU announces its move to online classes. Uh, so they announced this March 6th, and it's going to take place starting, uh, I believe, the 8th or the 9th, and a lot of other universities start doing this. And people at this point start realizing that there's something, I think, quite serious happening. Um, and within a week, we get notification that in Westchester County, the governor has instituted a one mile radius containment area. And this is really, I think, the beginning of people's real public consciousness that there's something quite serious going on. Uh, and then a few days later, we actually have the first COVID deaths uh, in New York. So just before this, uh, about a week before that, the National Science Foundation uh, announces that they are going to provide rapid funding for COVID related things. So this is quite unprecedented, uh, but then we've never had a pandemic uh, in, you know, in recent memory in the United States. So uh, this process happened super fast. So this it was on a Thursday. Oops, I wrote to the program director the next day. Uh, by Monday, I had been referred to the specific program that they thought my idea fit into. I pitched it to the program director uh, that day. I received a notice back the next day. I was invited to then submit the two-pager. I did that. I was then invited to do a full submission. And then as I was doing that, I was also preparing my IRB submission because we were obviously thinking about tracking human beings. Uh, I have to give huge credit to NYU. This is at the moment NYU has basically moved from in-person everything to in-person nothing. And yet we were able to process this grant proposal, uh, the IRB, get the IRB approval, and all the next steps with relatively little angst and difficulty. I mean, everybody just pulled together in this amazing way, and the grant was awarded. Uh, so we're looking from, you know, first step to last step, less than two weeks. Uh, we then advertised positions. We interviewed students. We hired the first student. Uh, we put the first student in the field. We eventually hired the 16th student on this project and, and off we went. And we knew that there was gonna be a lot of challenges to this project. It was a new collaboration. In fact, I think I could count on both hands the number of times that, uh, that Dr. Krishner and I had actually met each other over the last uh, four years that I've been at NYU. So it was a brand new collaboration, but I had this crazy idea and he seemed to be the right guy and he was crazy enough to say yes to me. Uh, so the university's opening you know, only remotely. So we can't get access to things, you know, equipment, we can't get access to computers, you know, that we've left in our offices, these kind of things. There's also a lot of conflict, uh, conflicting information going on about who can be hired, what can be spent. Uh, but despite that, we, we, we moved ahead and then we said, all right, this is gonna be very weird. We're hiring people sight unseen. Um, so Dr. Kirshner was great. He helped advertise this position with his global uh, health students, and we got a number of them, but a number of them from elsewhere in the university. And now everything gets turned on its head. So usually, you know, you do these interviews, you meet with people, you, you get them all situated, and we weren't allowed to do any of that. We, we couldn't contact the students, you know, in terms of being in the same place. We couldn't go out to the sites that we thought we might be monitoring. Uh, there was no opportunity for pilot work. 
Uh, there was no time for in-depth training. And we knew that because we were hiring people kind of on a very ad hoc basis, that they were gonna have different equipment to go and do this, this uh, data capture with. Um, and then we also knew that everybody had their own work. They had their own classes, they had their own finals. And that was the same for the faculty as well for the students. So we knew this was gonna be difficult. But maybe those were the easy things. And then we ran into a whole set of other challenges. So we really didn't know to what extent we were gonna be able to get coverage of the city. You know, we wanted to do something that was meaningful, that we were collecting data of how people behave coming out of medical facilities and, and in the subway in different neighborhoods. Because uh, New York's a very disparate place and we know that things uh, that might happen in one borough might be quite different than the others. And we really didn't know in terms of students' schedules and availabilities uh, when they were going to be out there collecting data. And in fact, we didn't even know if we were going to be permitted to be out there. So, and, and, I, and I say this quite seriously, that, you know, the only information we had about pause orders was, or examples were China and Italy. And in both of those, the communities were completely locked down. Unless you had a, an absolute critical need to be on the street, you were not permitted to be on the street. So here we were, we were feeling really great. We, we won the money, we, we recruited the staff, and then on the Sunday before basically the first student was to be out in the field, we get the notification of the pause order. And you know, how strict was this gonna be? How long were people gonna even be allowed to be on the street just doing whatever the heck they wanted? We, we really had no idea. So there was a lot of stress and a lot of like, we've gotta get these students out there now. Uh, there was also a lot of fluidity in terms of staffing issues. So we, amazingly, we had 81 students apply for positions. Um, it, it was really quite overwhelming. But unfortunately, several of the students that we initially hired came back to us within a day or two and said that either because their families or their roommates, um, they had to actually give up their permission, uh, per position that basically they were told they were not going to be welcome at home anymore if they went out onto the streets and did this data collection for us. Uh, you know, now that we're coming out of the pause order and we're, we're heading into phase three, I think sometimes we, we even forget how, how stressful all that time was and how much uncertainty there was. Um, we also ran into the problem of that there was a lot of fluidity in the facilities we chose, that some of them actually closed while we were trying to get uh, researchers out there. Some of them basically went strictly to remote visits, so there was nobody there to, to monitor. Um, we also, as, as faculty do, we sit in our ivory towers and we think we have a great idea and then we try to go out and do something. So my great idea was like, oh, well, of course, these students can take their smartphones and they can document where people go and who they are, you know, in terms of male, female, single, or by, you know, with a partner or whatever it is. And, and there's no problem. And we can get all that stuff into a GIS system into this ge geographic information system. Well, little did I know that for those who were using iPhones, that the best option that we had recommended, which was something called Draw Maps, uh, didn't actually have the export feature to get into the GIS system. So they just to export into what they call a, a KML or a KMZ. So we actually ended up having to work with this company, um, Bluefield GIS and a fellow named Worth Sparks. And they worked with us side by side to actually change their development schedule so that this feature that we needed, which they had thought about doing but had not prioritized, became the next thing that they worked on. And then they worked with Apple to do a very quick release of it. So we had tremendous um, cooperation and, and appreciation of what they did. We knew there was gonna be challenges to data consistency. You've got 16 people. You know, when do 16 people agree on exactly how to do something? Well, we gave them instructions, but you know, people do, they interpret things as they, as they see fit. 
Um, we didn't think about the fact that they're going to be standing out there. It's going to be raining. It's going to be cold. We certainly didn't expect that these poor <laughs> observers would have no access to bathrooms. That basically, because of the pause order, most everything shut down. And even things that weren't shut down were not letting people in uh, to use their facilities. And then just to top it off, I actually fell ill with COVID uh, on the first day that we were doing field collection, but I did not know that. And I was fairly lucky with a relatively light case, uh, but I was face down on my pillow 20 hours a day for a week. So we had all sorts of exciting challenges and, and these were not all of them. Um, some of our poor students, our poor brave <laughs> NYU students were out there and how can I say it? They, um, their actions and their presence was misinterpreted. So one of the students was asked by facility, you know, uh, personnel at the hospital whether they were homeless. Uh, one of our, our young women who was in front of one of our urgent care sites in Manhattan was very politely asked by the police, basically, if she was soliciting for prostitution. And yet our students persevered. They stood out there. Uh, and we also didn't know, you know, about kind of PPE. And so, you know, there were decisions that were made about what data to collect, what data not to collect of things that we hadn't necessarily thought of. But I think, you know, the most important and critical thing in my mind was the fortitude that these students faced in terms of being out at these sites. So you'll see in the bottom left, uh, this is at Elmhurst. So about halfway through um, our data collection, they started a major testing program. Elmhurst had, in Queens has won the highest rates in the city. Uh, and there were huge crowds of people, you know, milling around waiting to be tested. At many of the sites, there were also these uh, refrigerated trucks that were temporary morgues. And having gone out to these sites myself on a weekend, I, I can tell you how disturbing it is. And to think about these poor students standing there hour after hour, day after day, week after week watching this, I, I cannot begin to imagine the emotional impact um, that this had on them. But nobody quit. They all continued and they all persevered. And, and, and if that's not New York tough, I don't know what is. So um, the methodology we developed, uh, which was something else, I mean, nobody had ever done something like this, was to initially the idea was to have two tasks. One was to look at the egress behavior at med medical facilities. So what do people do when they come out of an urgent care or a hospital? What do they touch? Where do they go? Um, and then to look at touching behaviors in the subway. But it became readily apparent by the time we were ready to do field deployment that doing the second was just too dangerous. So we put all the resources into the first. Um, we selected facilities. We wanted to have a, a good distribution of facilities across the boroughs and across the facility types. And we had the goal of um, deploying people for 500 hours. In actuality, it was a little different. We started um, with, say, three Brooklyn hospitals and two, um, sorry, so let's just say three urgent cares and ended up with two urgent cares and, and four hospitals. But we tried to have at least, you know, three in each uh, borough. We could not recruit somebody from Staten Island. Out of 81 applications, there was not a single um, student from from Staten Island. And it was super important for us to make sure that we did not put our students in harm's way. So as a hiring procedure, I basically hired people if there was not yet somebody in their zip code and if they could walk to one of these types of facilities. We asked them all to work 10 to 20 hours a week. And ideally the facilities we selected were within one mile uh, of a subway station. In the end, we had five males and 11 females, both grad and undergrad. We covered four of the five boroughs. We were out there for eight weeks or eight weeks and one day um, from March 23rd to May 19th. And you'll see from the yellow dots on the right side of the screen that this is uh, the distribution of the 16 initial facilities. Uh, you'll see also that the lighter uh, colors in this represent a lower COVID rate. So we had very high rates in the Bronx, we had some very high rates in Queens, 
um, some kind of medium rates in much of Brooklyn and some lower rates, uh, particularly in Manhattan. The implementation, um, a lot of it had to do with creating an institutional review board policy that protected privacy and kept people safe. So the policy that we developed was that our observers would stand across the street from any facility with PPE on and that they would observe what was going on. They were not to have any engagement with any person not visual, not oral, no photos, no video. And we made no distinction between who was coming out of the facilities. We didn't write down that we thought it was a patient, a visitor, a staff. We just assumed that anybody who had been in there was potentially infected or had infection on them. Um, we asked them to just randomly select subjects and record so they were told to go out and stand in front of the facilities look down at their iphone or, or smartphone note the time and look up and the next person who came out of the facility that they were supposed to track they were supposed to note the date and the time that the person came out of the facility if they could tell the gender if they were by themselves or with additional people the last, uh, the end of the observation time, and most critically, where they went and what they touched. And we said, follow them for up to 20 minutes or up to one mile or until you lose visual contact of, with them. That meant if they went into a facility, they got into a car, they went down into the subway, that was the end of the record. Uh, so that project, the data collection on that project ended on May 19th. And since then, we've been working on data cleaning. In the end, um, we collected 1,500 hours of data and over 5,000 records. Uh, eight of our 16 uh, student employees have stayed on with us this summer to be volunteers. And they've been joined with a number of other volunteers uh, or students who've been supported through other programs that NYU has, including four students from the New York area through the ARISE program, which is a program for Tandon to support underrepresented um, students with a special focus on those who have no parents who have ever been to college. Um, and we were very fortunate to also receive some additional funding in the form of a very talented master's student from the Center of Data Science. Uh, through their DS3 program. Um, additionally, we were able to leverage some resor additional resources through something called the Vertically Integrated Project, which is a, also a Tandon project that's focused on getting undergrads involved with research. And through that, we were able to supplement some funding and go out and actually do laser scanning um, on the ground at 14 of these facilities where we went out and we basically collected the data that will become a 3D model. So if you take a look at the top right-hand corner, this is some work that I did in Dublin um, from the air, from a helicopter. We've recently finished this, a similar data set for Brooklyn around the Langone area, and we'll be putting our ground scans together with these aerial scans, uh, both our very high density ones and some lower density ones from the city with the idea of that not only are we marking where in space people are touching things, but then people can actually visualize what it was like to walk through that space and what some of these records look like as people go through and touch things. This is a snapshot of some of the data. Uh, not only did we kind of try to code all of this, but we then tried to go in and, and create some supplemental data to help other people use this data. So we attached it to weather data because some of our observers said that they felt that depending on whether it was raining or not, people behave very differently. Um, we then attached it to a lot of community-based data, say things like the CDC's uh, vulnerability index, which has seven factors looking at anything from age and health risks, risks to, um, to poverty levels, um, and then some additional community factors like that. So we're just getting ready to finish the cleaning on this and sending it out to the, to the community. 
Um, so I'm going to quickly show you a few of the, the initial findings, what I call the good, the bad, and the ugly. So you'll see here we've got a, a pretty good representation of a lot of data. Uh, here on the bottom, you see the Langone has a lot. There were actually two uh, researchers out there, two observers out there because of one of the um, urgent care has been closed. Uh, but it gives you a kind of a snapshot of the data and its, its distribution in terms of total quantity. One of the good things is that if you look at the blue brackets here, that's when we were out there collecting data. And we really did a pretty great job capturing this kind of peak uh, that happened in New York. And I think that this is really important that you can tie this back to physical things that are happening, whether it's new cases per day, new deaths per day, um, percentage of hospitalizations, these kind of things, particularly as other communities are really just starting to go into these phases. Uh, and of course, we're very concerned that there'll be a second wave, if not more, later here in New York. Um, we've just started doing some very initial data analysis. This is literally hot off the press. This is from yesterday's lab meeting. Um, students are trying to put together looking at how much data and how that data is distributed over that time period. So you can see here uh, that our first data was not actually collected in Manhattan until the 1st of April, but it goes all the way to the, the 19th of May. Um, in terms of the Bronx, we've got similar data sets, the, the light ones being the urgent cares and the dark ones being the hospitals. And here we have it in Queens and here in Brooklyn, which is obviously where we've got the majority of our data. Uh, some very initial analysis shows that uh, about a third, oh, sorry, about a quarter of the records that had a final destination uh, had interim destinations. So it's where people stopped, they did one thing, and then they went somewhere else. And there were a variety of things that they did and places that they touched. Uh, most people ended up in personal vehicles, which is, I think, kind of an interesting uh, finding in and of itself. But obviously, that changes a lot from facility to facility and from borough to borough. Uh, let's see. Um, if we look at some of the bad things we found, we found that in some cases that 90% of the people coming out of a facility were touching something. Um, this often had to do with things very close to the hospital exit. Many people were touching doors that were actually automatic doors. Uh, they were touching handrails coming out of the facilities. They were touching the trash can nearby. The um, the crosswalk. They were also doing a huge amount of touching their phones uh, and other things like that. Uh, we found that also that was something quite interesting that the amount of public transportation people were taking was not at all influenced in a, in a positive way by the infection rates. So here in the bottom right hand corner you have all the way at the right hand side, the highest infection rates, but it's also the highest amount of public transportation, which you know I think anecdotally indicates that there's issues of, of wealth disparity that's happening very strongly um, across this data set. Uh, one of the other quite bad things we found was that 16% of the subjects re-entered the facility. They went out, they had a smoke, they had a phone, they used a phone. They grabbed some food and, and they were going in and they were touching all sorts of things themselves, the, the surrounding areas. Um, they were interacting with their PPE. Sometimes they took it off and put it places. Sometimes they wore it and came back with it. Um, and in one case, we actually um, found that somebody had discarded a cigarette on the ground and that a couple of hours later, a homeless person came up and picked it up and started to smoke it, which is I'm sure a transmission vector that most people had not thought about. Um, we also uh, accidentally followed people home. 
Uh, we, we really tried on this IRB to protect people's privacy, but when we got the data, what we found was that in some cases, we actually followed people home, which was something that we had not anticipated and will have to be adjusted in the GIS data so that uh, it's not immediately clear who this person might be. Um, one of the other problems is that in this data set, the correlations are not immediately obvious. There's a lot of things that happen, but you know, if we're looking, um, say, just at one facility here, this is out in Queens, um, that what happens in week one, two, three, four, five, all the way to week nine, there's not a, a real clear trend of what's going on. So there's obviously a lot of work that needs to be done with this. Um, in terms of next steps, in case you guys had not seen Banksy's uh, contribution to COVID-19, here it is before it was taken down out of the London subway earlier today. Uh, we are currently planning an August 1 target data release. And uh, what all this means, I'm going to turn back to Dr. Kirshner to uh, give you some more information about the context of this and next steps. Tom, you're on mute. And James, we don't have your screen yet. Okay, I'm back. All right. So, yeah, it, this this is a pilot project. We're uh, amazingly, and I'm honored to be part of it too. Like Dr. Lafer said, this has certainly been a rapid uh, project, and uh, we're barely entering the analysis phase. Certainly, we're uh, casting an eye towards more formal research projects, opportunities to focus on some of the, there's sensitive aspects to this work, but working with uh, individual subjects and, and we're thinking about how to engage. There, there are though, we want to make sure and highlight uh, a number of opportunities for other people to get involved in a meaningful way with this project. This project is multi-layered in this sense. So certain aspects, Dr. Leifer was just describing, have the potential for, for privacy concerns and obviously have to be handled uh, with IRB supervision and all of those things. As part of this though, we, we built some other resources that are complementary that, that uh, people on this call or elsewhere could, could utilize. Uh, I guess I would say we haven't even started to try to, to push these out and, and maybe this sort of alumni forum and others like this are, are the perfect place if there's anybody who wants to give us advice or, or has thoughts about how we might engage with the broader community, um, we'd, we'd be all ears for that sort of thing. So the slide we have up here is uh, kind of a placeholder. Th this is uh, built on a qual NYU Qualtrics uh, enrollment survey that we developed. Uh, starting with it is partly for a segue, but um, we're going to distribute, I think we already have in the chat, the link to this. This is live, and if anybody wants to, I'm going to describe what it does a little bit more in a second, but if anybody wants to actually start contributing data about what's happening on the ground in their area, uh, particularly if you live in New York City, uh, then if you click on this link and go through this process, uh, you could download what's called the Mapillary app, kind of like capillary, but Mapillary. Uh, and this is an app that works alongside a resource that if you're not aware of, you should be, I think, uh, which is called OpenStreetMap. If you go to openstreetmap.org, uh, you'll find a really essential resource. It's basically the open source alternative to Google Maps and Microsoft Bing and all that, which you may or may not know are highly proprietary in terms of the data that's stored with them. them. Uh, Mapillary is a service that allows anybody with an Android or, or iOS phone with certain, a new enough one, certain capabilities, so, um, can essentially add data to the map. Now, normally OpenStreetMap is like Google Maps or the others, it's more of a static cross-sectional view but um, if actually uh, we could move forward, I'll say a little bit more about this. There have been new um, suffix suffixes added and there's an understanding of a need to look at things more longitudinally, right? So we might know what phase we're in, but I can vouch being down here in the village that uh, the degree that social distancing is being 
uh, can glide with and the nature of things on the street changes from block to block, right? And so when we ask a question like, is the pause ordinance working? In a lot of ways, it's a highly dynamic question, okay? So um, there's an opportunity for anybody. Uh, now, there, there's also opportunity for controversy here, and I'm gonna just stay clear of that. I, I'm happy to answer questions, give my own personal thoughts on it. But that notwithstanding, uh, this type of technology could be very powerful because literally anybody who wants to use this mapillary app can start to document what's happening. Now, uh, this is an example of the project page we had set up and our, our team, Deborah was just described, Dr. Leifer was just describing, uh, did take a stab at this. And this is an image of the Langone Center, uh, around the Langone Center in Brooklyn, where we have a lot of, ton of other data as well. Uh, and and the, the blue lines just represent the street view mapillary imagery that we collected. Again, it's, it's sort of preliminary pilot way as part of this project. Uh, there's a feed and you can zoom in and out and take a look at, at where we've started this effort. Uh, can you go to the next slide? James. These uh, little lines here are image data. And uh, in the, I'm going to just say this stuff quickly for if, if you're not familiar with how OpenStreetMap works or how it's used for humanitarian uh, relief efforts. Those are things that we'd be happy to, if there's questions, we could talk more about. But essentially, uh, the idea is that with these Street View images, it's possible to mine them. Uh, and annotate them, as we say, for information. So here's an example. We're using a map. Uh, we have links for all of this. This is live. Uh, this is a tasking manager called Map Roulette, and it's uh, we've populated it with both the locations of our medical center, healthcare centers across the city, and the mapillary data that we're generating. And so you can see an image of an, e an ER entrance there uh, at that same area of uh, New York City. There's instructions on the left and uh, with some basic training uh, in how to annotate a, a GIS, uh, th this is an opportunity for people to go in and help us annotate. And this is gonna get more interesting. For instance, if you think about your blood, if, if you live in Soho or something like that, uh, you know, this is a way that we can document longitudinally what's happening as restaurants put more tables out, etc. Uh, and so there's there's an opportunity here just to summarize uh, if, if we go the, you know two slides back and again we'll provide the, the link um, and anyone can enroll and use the the mapillary app there's a in this instructional process there's there's a, a point at which it, uh, it shows how to link your app to our project and I'll, I'll hold on that for now it's not that hard you have to create an account and basically you have to, you, through this survey, we receive your username, we add you to the project. And then from that point on, any of the data you collect with your app would be credited in part of this project. I'd also say that's a great way if you're, if you're really interested and want to get in touch with us, uh, it's a great way to do so, right? Uh, we, uh, we'd be happy to follow up, especially with people who are, uh, you know, able to, to help us with this with this process. So, you know, we see a lot of opportunity here, both for supplementing the science and supporting advocacy efforts. Uh, but, you know, we don't want to put the cart in front of the horse either. So, it, we, you know, we're describing these now. Uh, they exist. We're looking forward to not only moving into the analysis phase, ramping up the work that Dr. Leifer was just describing, but we're really interested in how, you know, potential for scaling this up and thinking about uh, empowering people who want to get involved uh, to start contributing themselves. And at this point in time, uh, I see there's a, a few questions that are beginning to stream in. I would certainly encourage the attendees that are uh, with us this afternoon, if you have particular questions for Dr. Leifer or, or Krishner, uh, to provide them in the Q&A function and, uh, and we can sort of move forward um, through there. Uh, the first question that has just come in uh, is uh, a question regarding uh, were the observers able to note if they had follow or seen a subject uh, before uh, while the data had been occurring, maybe recognizing somebody from a previous interaction and, and what um, accommodations might have been made for that. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, as I said, we try to keep our observers fairly far 
from um, from anyone coming out of these facilities, but it is possible that um, they caught a, a surgeon coming out twice or a security guard or something like that. Another question is, um, do we plan uh, to, you know, correlate the observations with outbreak data from the health department in either the city of New York or another sort of uh, organization? Very much so. Um, when we first started doing this project, the data was being released in a very aggregated way. But as of, I think, last week, the health department re-released all the data in PDF form day by day for infection rates uh, by zip code, by um, hospitalization levels in, in four or five different ways on a zip code level. And we're able to then correlate with that, um, both at the, the facility level, at the borough level, and then across the city as well. So we're very excited to, to have that data set now available to us. And uh, the next question on the line uh, looks to be about sort of use case scenario uh, in terms of, you know, what um, story this data will tell and how we will be able to use it in regards to maybe the narrative of COVID spread or maybe in future uh, uses uh, beyond just the immediate. Well, I mean, I think, you know, from, from the very immediate, if you find that 100% of the people are nearly are touching things on the way out the door, and a good portion of these are, are your staff, there's certainly an opportunity for training and things like that, as well as public education. Um, you know, if you find that people are touching specific things, maybe even put notes on them, you know, or, or signs on them, asking them, you know, while they're disposing, please don't touch the thing or to come out and clean things on a regular basis. Um, I think what we learned mostly so far is how much things on a person they're actually touching. You know, that I think there's been some studies where it says that the average person touches their phone 85 times a day. And yet the studies we've seen coming out of Europe and China on the infection levels of personal property of hospital personnel is enormous. That they're looking at like 85% of all things that a, a nurse or a doctor or another practitioner in a hospital has is coming out infected. And if these people are then going outside and then putting that to their face, uh, taking their cigarette pack and putting it in their mouth, maybe you know discarding that and then somebody else picking it up, there's probably a lot of ways that some public education can help on just reducing that risk. It's not gonna get rid of it. Uh, and I think just anything we can do to raise awareness. And then, you know, I think what's exciting is that this was a whole new way of looking at this data um, in terms of touch and the 3D and the hyper-localization. And I think what we've shown in this pilot project is that this is a, a valid methodology to apply to other locations and maybe even other problems besides COVID. Tom? Yeah, I, if I could just, am I on mute? Nope, you're good. You're good. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so, and this is just sort of the, the complementary side of this. There's, there's what people are touching, there's the human behavior side, and there's sort of the opportunities they have, right, to touch things, public spaces, and how these things are, are rolling out and evolving over time. From a scientific point of view, right, you could ask yourself, well, if, if, a, if an ordinance like PAUSE works, well, why does it work? Well, we assume, it's not that complicated, right, on a certain level. We assume that it's reducing opportunities for people to come into contact with either places or other people that are going to cause a transmission, right? So when we just look across the whole city in a blanket way, we're blind to that. We, we can't see that, that sort of that rubber hitting the road piece. There's a question about how we associate these data with the you know, sort of COVID indicators at that more local granular uh, geographic level. And, and that's the sort of thing we can do because if, if pause or these sort of ordinances are, are doing what they're think, we think they're doing, well, if we can measure them, in a, in a concrete way uh, by the, using the methods that we've described today, uh, it stands to reason that uh, we would expect the success of the ordinance to vary as a function of the local geographic environments. And so we'll be able to take a look at that. I mentioned the idea of optimizing these uh, ordinances. Uh, there's potential here 
to notice in a data-driven sort of way which aspects uh, of the built or social environment are changing as a as a as a result of uh, pause, and which seem to have the the tightest link to the outcome data that we have uh, uh, that would correspond with that. Great, and I know that we are pushing right up against the two o'clock mark um, that was sort of, uh, you know, targeted for the conclusion of our program. So I, I know that there's a, a whole host of different questions uh, that are still coming in. Uh, but with that, I did want to highlight ways in which you can sort of, you know, continue the conversation after this afternoon. Uh, on this particular slide, you'll find the social media links for both of the units within NYU that doctors uh, Leifner and uh, Kirshner are participant to and where this research is going on. Of course, on the left-hand side, the Center for Urban Science and Progress, or CUSP, and then on the right-hand side of the slide, the School of Global Public Health, um, some of the uh, various resources that are, are coming um, out there as well. And again, there will be a follow-up communication later this afternoon uh, to all of the sort of participants today. Uh, there'll be a survey. Certainly feel free to provide your feedback, any additional questions. I can help manage them and, and, and triage them, if you will. Um, and of course, uh, the, the links that um, Drs. Krishner and um, Dr. Uh, Leifer had provided regarding some of the ways in which to get involved in this program moving forward. Um, any concluding thoughts uh, to, to either uh, you, Deborah, or, or to Tom? Um, I just that we're targeting August 1 for a data release um, and I think anybody who's interested in just even playing with this data and looking at it, you know, it'll be something that will be readily accessible and, and quite, I think, interesting for the community. So keep your, your eyes peeled for that. Great, and thank you uh, to both of you for joining us uh, this afternoon. It's always incredible to share some of the NYU research with our NYU alumni community. Uh, and also be on the lookout for upcoming events hosted uh, through the Alumni Association and our various organizations across the university. Again, we're hosting about 700 events a year, many of them online. So hope to see many of you again soon. If you wanna get involved uh, with the Alumni Association, all of our social media links and so forth are on this slide here. Um, and of course, uh, you know, this program was certainly provided free of charge. Uh, if any of you are in a position that would like to help support the university or our students in need, uh, please do consider making a gift to the Emergency Relief Fund, um, which supports our students that are going through uh, very difficult times at this particular moment. Uh, we've already distributed about $4 million to students, and we can only do that through your support and generous philanthropy. So thank you to our alumni community for that as well. Uh, this session was recorded and will be made available on our website within the next 48 to 72 hours. So thank you everybody for joining us and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.